The House will come to order. Prayer by the Chaplain. Good morning. Deeply embedded in my faith tradition of Judaism is the principle of communal responsibility. The biblical book of Deuteronomy conveys the idea that a person is born into a host of obligations that are unalienable. Each of us is responsible for all of us. In the story that Minnesotans can especially appreciate, the rabbis 2,000 years ago told of a group of people floating along in a boat. One takes a hand drill and begins to bore a hole in the bottom of the boat. Another calls out, asking, what are you doing? The first responds, what is it your concern? I'm drilling a hole in my side of the boat. The second reminds him, don't you realize that we are all in the same boat? Your actions will sink us all. We are all in the same boat. This view is best captured in American political thought by the concept of social contract. One person cannot assert in the name of personal liberty that they have the right and should have the freedom to do something that will harm us all. As our government representatives row us through turbulent waters, we pray for your well well-being and your wisdom. May our leaders live up to the critical challenges we face, always remembering that we are all in the same boat. Amen. The chaplain for today is Rabbi Harold Kravitz from Adath Yersharan Congregation, Minnetonka, Minnesota. Pledge of Allegiance. Please remain standing and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Members, the clerk will now take the roll. Please state your name very clearly, your location, and present. Acom. Acom, St. Paul, present. Acom, St. Paul, present. Albright. Albright, St. Paul, present. Anderson. Anderson, Barsness Township, present. Anderson, Barsness Township, present. Backer. Backer, Browns Valley, present. Backer, Browns Valley, present. Bonner. Bonner. Bar. Bar, East Bethel, present. Bar, East Bethel, present. Baker. Baker, Wilmer, present. Baker, Wilmer, present. Becker, Finn. Becker, Finn, St. Paul, present. Bennett. Bennett Albert Lee present. Bennett Albert Lee present. Bernardi. Bernardi St. Paul present. Bernardi St. Paul present. Bierman. Bierman St. Paul present. Bierman St. Paul present. Bowl. Bowl St. Paul present. Bowl St. Paul present. Brand. Brand St. Paul present. Brand St. Paul present. Cantrell. Cantrell Savage present. Cantrell Savage present. Carlson A. Carlson A, St. Paul, present. Carlson A, St. Paul, present. Carlson L. Carlson L, Crystal, soon to be St. Paul, present. Carlson L, Crystal, Christensen. Christensen, St. Paul, present. Christensen, St. Paul, present. Claflin. Claflin, St. Paul, present. Claflin, St. Paul, present. Considine. Considine. Daniels. Daniels Fairbolt present. <clears throat> Daniels Fairbolt present. Doubt. Doubt St. Paul present. Davids. David St. Paul present. Daphne. Daphne St. Paul present. Daphne St. Paul present. Dean. Dean St. Paul present. Dean St. Paul present. Damoth. Damus, St. Paul present. Detmer. 
Detmer, Forest Lake, present. Detmer, Forest Lake, present. Truskowski. Truskowski, St. Paul, present. Truskowski, St. Paul, present. Eklund. Eklund, St. Paul, present. Eklund, St. Paul, present. Edelson. Edelson, Edina, present. Edelson, Edina, present. Elkins. Elkins, St. Paul, present. Elkins, St. Paul, present. Erickson. Erickson, Maple Grove, present. Erickson, Maple Grove, present. Fabian. Hey, Fabian, St. Paul, present. Fabian, St. Paul, present. Fisher. Fisher, St. Paul, present. Fisher, St. Paul, present. Franzen. <clears throat> Franzen, St. Paul, I mean, sorry, sorry. Alexandria Township, present. <clears throat> Franzen, Alexandria Township, present. Freiburg. Freiburg, Changuatana Township, present. Freiburg, Otano Pre Township, present. Garofalo. Garofalo. Gomez. Gomez, St. Paul, present. Gomez, St. Paul, present. Green. Green, Faustin, present. Green, Faustin, present. Grossel. What? Grossel, Clearbrook, present. Grossel, Clearbrook, present. Grunhagen. <laughs> Grunhagen, uh, New Auburn Township, present. Grunhagen, <clears throat> Upper Township, Present. Gunther. Gunther Fairmont present. Gunther Fairmont present. Haley. Haley Red Wing present. Haley Red Wing present. Halverson. <clears throat> Halverson. Hamilton. Hamilton Mountain Lake present. Hamilton Mountain Lake present. Hanson. Hanson, St. Paul, present. Hanson, St. Paul, present. Hassan. Hassan, Minneapolis, present. Hassan, Minneapolis, present. Hausman. Hausman, St. Paul, present. Hausman, St. Paul, present. Heinrich. Heinrich, Anoka, present. Heinrich, Anoka, present. Heinzman. Heinzman. Her. Her, St. Paul, present. Her, St. Paul, present. Her toss. Her toss, Deadwood, South Dakota, present. Her toss, Deadwood, South Dakota, present. Hornstein. Hornstein, Minneapolis, present. Hornstein, Minneapolis, present. Howard. Howard, St. Paul, present. Howard, St. Paul, present. Hewitt. Hewitt, St. Paul, present. Hewitt, St. Paul, present. Johnson. Johnson, St. Paul, present. Jordan. Jordan, St. Paul, present. Jordan, St. Paul, present. Jurgens. Jurgens, Cottage Grove, present. Jurgens, Cottage Grove, present. Keel. Keel, Alexandria, present. Keel, Alexandria, present. Cleavorn. Cleavorn, St. Paul, present. Cleavorn, St. Paul, present. <clears throat> Cagle. Cagle, St. Paul, present. Cagle, St. Paul, present. Katiza Watoon. Katiza Watoon, Eden Prairie, present. Katiza Watoon, Eden Prairie, present. Kosnick. Kosnick, Lakeville, present. Kosnick, Lakeville, present. <laughs> Creshaw. Creshaw, Little Falls, present. Creshaw, Little Falls, present. Kunish Podine. Kunish Podine, St. Paul, present. Kunish Podine, St. Paul, present. Layman. Layman, Cohasset, present. Layman, Cohasset, present. Lee. Lee, St. Paul, present. Lee, St. Paul, present. Lesh. Lesh, St. Paul, present. Lesh, St. Paul, present. Liebling. Liebling, St. Paul, present. Liebling, St. Paul, present. Lean. Lean, Moorhead, present. Lean, Moorhead, present. Lily. Lily, St. Paul, present. Lily, St. Paul, present. Lippert. Lippert, St. Paul, present. Lippert, St. Paul, present. Lislagard. Lislagard, St. Paul, present. Lislagard, St. Paul, present. Long. Long, St. Paul, present. Lucero. Lucero, St. Paul, present. Lewick. Lewick, Aiken, present. Lewick, Aiken, present. Mahoney. Mahoney, St. Paul, present. Mahoney, St. Paul, present. Mann. Mann, St. Paul, present. Mann, St. Paul, present. Mariani.
Mariani. Markward. Markward, Monticello, present. Markward, Monticello, present. Mason. Mason, St. Paul, present. Mason, St. Paul, present. McDonald. McDonald, Delano, present. McDonald, Delano, present. Mecklen. <clears throat> Meckland, Becker Township, present. Meckland, Becker Township, present. Miller. Miller, St. Paul, present. Miller, St. Paul, present. Moeller. Moeller, St. Paul, present. Moeller, St. Paul, present. Moran. Moran, St. Paul, present. Moran, St. Paul, present. Morrison. Morrison, St. Paul, present. Morrison, St. Paul, present. Munson. Munson, St. Paul, present. Murphy. Murphy, St. Paul, present. Murphy, St. Paul, present. Nash. Nash, Waconia, present. Nash, Waconia, present. Nelson M. Nelson M., St. Paul, present. Nelson M., St. Paul, present. Nelson N. Nelson N., Clover Township, present. Nelson N., Clover Township, present. New. New, St. Paul, present. Nor. Nor, St. Paul, present. Norness. Nornas Fergus Falls, present. Nornas Fergus Falls, present. Novotny. Novotny Elk River, present. Novotny Elk River, present. O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll Sartell, present. O'Driscoll Sartell, present. Olson. Olson St. Paul, present. O'Neill. <clears throat> O'Neill Maple Lake, present. O'Neill Maple Lake, present. Pulowski. Pulowski Winona, present. Pulowski Winona, present. Purcell. Purcell, St. Paul, present. Purcell, St. Paul, present. Petersburg. Petersburg, St. Paul, present. Petersburg, St. Paul, present. Pearson. Pearson. Pearson, Rochester Township, present. Pearson, Rochester Township, present. Pinto. Pinto, St. Paul, present. Pinto, St. Paul, present. Poppy. Poppy, Austin, present. Poppy, Austin, present. Poston. Poston, Lakeshore, present. Poston, Lakeshore, Shore, present. Pryor. Pryor, St. Paul, present. Pryor, St. Paul, present. Quam. Quam, Byron, present. Quam, Byron, present. Richardson. Richardson, St. Paul, present. Richardson, St. Paul, present. Robbins. Robbins, St. Paul, present. Runbeck. Runback, Circle Pines, present. Runback, Circle Pines, present. Sandell. Sandell, St. Paul, present. Sandell, St. Paul, present. Sandstead. Sandstead, Hibbing, present. Sandstead, Hibbing, present. Salk. Salk, Rochester, present. Salk, Rochester, present. Schumacher. Schumacher, Laverne, present. Schumacher, Laverne, present. Schultz. Schultz, Garden Township, present. Schultz, Garden Township, present. Scott. Scott, Andover, present. Scott, Andover, present. Stevenson. Stevenson, St. Paul, present. Stevenson, St. Paul, present. Sundin. Sundin, St. Paul, present. Sundin, St. Paul, present. Swazinski. Swazinski, Hendricks, present. Swazinski, Hendrick, present. Tabkey. Tabke, St. Paul, present. Tabke, St. Paul, present. Tice. Tice, St. Cloud, present. Tice, St. Cloud, present. Torkelson. Torkelson, St. Paul, present. Erdahl. Erdahl, St. Paul, present. Vang. Vang, St. Paul, present. Vang, St. Paul, present. Vogel. Vogel, Elko, Newmarket, present. Vogel, Elko, Newmarket, present. Wagenius. Wagenia Solem Township present. Wagenia Solem Township present. Waslowick. Waslowick, St. Paul present. Waslowick, St. Paul present. West. 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 West Blaine present. West Blaine present. Winkler. Winkler, St. Paul present. Walgamot. Walgamot, St. Paul present. Walgamot, St. Paul present. Zhang Jay. Zhang Jay. Zhang T. Zhang T. St. Paul present. Zhang T. St. Paul present. Joachim. 
Joaquin St. Paul present. Joaquin St. Paul present, Speaker Hartman. Speaker Hartman, St. Paul present. Bonner. Bonner, St. Paul present. Bonner, St. Paul present. Considine. Bon Is Bonner finished? Uh, yeah. Considine, St. Paul present. Considine, St. Paul present. Garofalo. Garofalo. Halverson. Halverson. Heinzman. Niswa, present. Heinzman. Heinzman, Niswa. Heinzman, Niswa, present. Mariani. Mariani. Zhang J. Zhang J. Zhang J. St. Paul present. Zhang J. St. Paul present. A quorum is present. The clerk will read the journal of the preceding day. <clears throat> journal of the House, second special session, 2020. Second day, St. Paul, Minnesota, Tuesday, July 14th, 2020. If there is no objection, further reading of the journal will be dispensed with and the journal will be approved as corrected by the chief clerk. Hearing no objection, the journal is approved <clears throat> as corrected by the chief clerk. <clears throat> Comparison reports. A copy of this order of business is online. If there's no objection, the reports, sorry, the motions will prevail. Hearing no objection, the motions prevail and the substitutions will be made. <laughs> Reports of standing committees and divisions. A copy of this order of business is online. If there's no objection, the reports will be adopted. Hearing no objection, the reports are adopted. <laughs> Second reading of House Files. <clears throat> Second reading, House File number 28. Second reading. Second reading of Senate Files. Second reading, Senate file number two. Second reading. Second reading, Senate file number 12. Second reading. Introduction of House Files. The following House Files have been offered for introduction today. The Chief Clerk will report the House Files and give them their first reading. Introduction of first reading of House Files 93 through 99. First reading, House Files 93 through 99. Report from the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration. Winkler from the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration, pursuant to Rules 1.21, designates the following bills to be placed on the calendar for the day for Monday, July 20th, 2020. House file numbers 1, 3, and 14. Motions and resolutions. The clerk will report the resolution. <clears throat> house resolution number one, a house resolution declaring racism a public health crisis. Richardson moves that house resolution number one be now adopted. The member from Dakota, Representative Richardson, to your motion. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. House resolution one declares racism a public health crisis and would establish a House Select Committee to address systemic racism and advance equity in the Minnesota House of Representatives and in the state. I would like to start with acknowledging the legislative assistant to the Majority Leader, Benta, for all of her work and support during this process. I would also like to recognize the efforts of the Posse Caucus and the development of the resolution as well and acknowledging the overwhelming support we have received from medical associations, uh, nonprofits, advocacy associations, all acknowledging that racism is a public health crisis that the state must confront. Members, it's important that we acknowledge this resolution is long overdue. 
We must confront the reality that inaction, indifference, and systemic racism has harmed generations of Indigenous, Black, Latinx, and Asian Minnesotans. Behind the mask of Minnesota NICE lies some of the nation's widest and deepest disparities. When it comes to income inequality, Minnesota ranks 50th. We have the second worst median income gap in the nation between white and black residents. Our home ownership gap put Minnesota at 49th. Prior to COVID, the pandemic, uh, prior to the pandemic of, of COVID, the black unemployment rate in Minnesota was double the white rate. In the midst of this pandemic, an estimated one in two black Minnesotans have applied for unemployment compared with about one in four white Minnesotans. And that's just a focus on the economy. We are 50th for the disparities between who has at least a high school diploma. We are 44th in the nation for our standardized testing gap. And we have significant disparities in our school discipline rates with Indigenous students being 10 times more likely to be expelled or suspended than white students, and Black students being eight times more likely to be expelled or suspended. There are also significant disparities, and the research is clear. Racism is literally killing our communities. Take, for example, the maternal child health mortality outcomes. Black women are three to four times more likely to die during pregnancy and childbirth than white women. Even when you control for educational attainment, wealth, socioeconomic status, and general overall health, that disparity still exists. And what is even more heartbreaking about that disparity is the fact that 60% of those deaths are preventable. Another devastating reality is that Black infants and Black babies are twice as likely to die before their first birthday when compared to white infants. In fact, in Minnesota, the highest excess safe death rates exist for Indigenous and Black people at every age demographic. Racism is a public health crisis, just as COVID-19 is a public health crisis. And just as we as a body confronted the crisis of COVID head-on with reforms and legislation, we too should be confronting the deadly impacts of systemic racism. By taking this first step of declaring racism a public health crisis, the Minnesota House will acknowledge that racism is alive and well in our communities and will also acknowledge that the promise embodied in the statement, all men are created equal, has not been realized. As I shared in the Rules Committee last week, it took well over 400 years of persistent and unrelenting injustice to get to this moment. And we know that this resolution is simply a single step forward. We cannot undo 400 years of uh, systemic racism in a resolution or within a, a single special session. But this resolution goes beyond acknowledgement and calls for concrete steps to be taken. The resolution would move the House forward by ensuring that we're collaborating with the state's law and justice agencies and the community to work to ensure public confidence that public safety is administered equitably it will require the House study, evaluate, and conduct an assessment of the existing policies and practices of the Minnesota House through an intersectional lens of race equity and set measurable goals to achieve. It would focus on enhancing data-driven education efforts on understanding and addressing how racism affects public health, family stability, early childhood education, economic development, public safety, housing, and the delivery of human services. It also calls for meaningful engagement with the, compute, uh, with the community and supporting local, regional, and federal initiatives to address and dismantle racism. The resolution also calls for the convening of a House Select Committee to ensure House legislative efforts are analyzed through an intersectional race equity lens. Since the statehood of Minnesota, Laws and policies have been enacted that have explicitly, implicitly, and unintentionally impacted Black, Brown, and Indigenous people. Even when these laws have been repealed, the after effects are still deeply felt within communities and within our state. 
Minnesota will never be able to truly move forward and prosper as a state if it doesn't guarantee equitable opportunities to every resident, regardless of their race. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Hennepin, Representative Hassan. Madam Speaker and members, I rise today in support of House Resolution 1, which declares racism as public health crisis. According to American Public Health Association, racism structures opportunity and assigns value based on how a person looks. The result conditions that unfairly advantage some and unfairly disadvantage others. Racism hurts the health of our nation by preventing some people the opportunity to attain their highest level of health. Racism may be intentional or unintentional. It operates at various levels in society. Racism is a driving force of the social determinants of health, such as housing, education, employment, and it's a barrier to health equity. My comments will be addressing systemic racism in housing. According to the United Nations International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, adequate housing is a fundamental human right, defining it as the right to live somewhere in security, peace, and dignity. It further clarifies this right to include security of tenure, adequate conditions, protection against forced evictions, and access to affordable housing. Home ownership and high quality affordable rental housing are critical tools for wealth building and financial well being in the United States. We, as a country, have a dark history of creating policies that have been used as a tool to displace, exclude, segregate the Black, Indigenous, and people of color in this country. One of the most well known examples of displacement is the Indian Removal Act. President Andrew, Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act into law in 1930, authorizing the federal government to forcibly relocate Native Americans in the Southeast in order to make room for white settlement. For the next two decades, thousands of Native Americans died of hunger, disease, and exhaustion on a forced march west of the Mississippi River, a march known as the Trail of Tears. Black communities in urban areas have also suffered displacement and gentrification as public policies have often been enacted under the guise of creating new public spaces. For instance, in the early 1850s, New York City lawmakers used ominous domain to destroy a thriving predominantly black community in Manhattan, displacing thousands of residents in order to create the public uh, space known today as the Central Park. One of the heinous, most heinous uh, policies that was introduced was the creation of the Federal Housing Administration in 1934, which lasted until 1968. We are very much familiar how that public policy destroyed other communities and gave white communities wealth and ownership of their neighborhoods. Redlining destroyed the possibility of investment wherever black people lived. In the 50s, in the St. Paul neighborhood, Rondo, south of University Avenue, was home Almost to almost 85% um, black population. And it was destroyed because of Interstate 94 was built through it. According to Minnesota History Center, originally the freeway was supposed to be built through university, but the university community, which was made up of University of Minnesota professors and students protested. Instead, the developers moved to the Rondo neighborhood whose residents were either unable to protest or their protest was unheard. As a result, thousands of Rwanda residents were displaced into a segregated and discriminatory housing market of the Twin Cities, and the previously vibrant independent neighborhood was largely erased. Fast forward today, in Minnesota home ownership rate among white households is 77.5, while the rate among communities of color is 38.2, leaving a gap of 39.3. In St. Paul, only 17% of black uh, community members are home owners. In Minneapolis, it's only 19.8. According to a research from the lab, uh, research lab center, it states that across the country, a little over 40% of black households own their own homes, while 70% of white households are homeowners. 
the gap is pronounced more in Minnesota, which is about 50% difference. 50 years after the Fair Housing Act, Black Americans are no more likely to own a home than they did back then. Today, in Minneapolis and St. Paul, our local parks are filled with, uh, with unhoused folks who have no place to go. Decades of racist policies and disinvestment to Black, Indigenous, and people of color is the result of why our parks are filled with unhoused folks who are sleeping. Disparities and in inequity are the leading cause of higher homelessness in Black, Indigenous, and people of color of Minnesota. Home ownership allows families to acquire generational wealth. It stabilizes their housing as well as their lives. Stable housing and home ownership translates to staying in the same neighborhood for generations, which means one is less, one is less likely to end up being homeless. Homeless folks are more prone to contracting diseases, more prone to being victims of violence, more prone to die early, and more prone to chronic stress. And therefore, I think that it's fundamentally and morally correct to declare racism and systemic racism as a public health crisis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Sibley, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam. Or, yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. Yeah, I uh, have read over this uh, resolution, and uh, I do have some areas of agreement, but I also got some areas of concern. Uh, you know, one of the areas of agreement would be uh, lines 2.23 and 2.24 about studying, evaluating, and conducting an assessment. I think we can all agree there's uh, problems that need to be addressed, but, you know, I see the achievement gap as a major problem in the uh, in the process that leads to a lot of uh, uh, leads to a lot of influence on the other problems we see. And I, you know, I do think that the uh, competition between public, private, and uh, religious schools is the best way through school choice to address that. You know, we spent millions and even billions on trying to solve this for decades, and we're still in the same situation that we were before. The good news is the U.S. Supreme Court recently ruled that school choice is legal, and we can address that. You know, I've, I've said some other things in the uh, essay I wrote, the Manifesto to End Racism in America, so I won't repeat any of that. But uh, I certainly would want to be a, in a part of the process uh, of addressing this, and uh, but um, and I completely agree, and I think all of us do that. We have to provide a ladder for blacks and minorities to move into the middle class, and addressing the achievement gap, I think, is a big part of it. Uh, the other thing, the. Uh, you know, as far as as far as today is concerned, I'm probably not going to vote yes or no on this resolution uh, until I see what direction it's taking. But I would definitely say I'd want to be a part of the process in the future. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and Representative Richardson, uh, for this discussion. The member from Morrison, Representative Creshaw. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members, and thank you, Representative Richardson, for bringing forth this resolution. We have before us a resolution addressing the complex issue of racism in Minnesota, a stain that we simply can't ignore nor remove easily from the fabric of our society, an issue that requires awareness, education, deliberate solutions, hard action, and unrest and protest from time to time to bring this forward. The concern of this resolution for me is not what is in the resolution, it is the pieces that have been left out. On line 1.18, it is stated that racism is complex. Then it goes forth to try and encapsulate racism, which is impossible, in my opinion. And this body cannot define the impact or dimensions of racism with a simple majority vote and words on paper. The other persistent issue with offering a resolution like this 
is the unintended consequence of trying to divide the body instead of unite. One of the best solutions to combating racism is to have conversations and build shared experiences, allowing people to realize the challenges, difficulties, and obstructions that exist within different communities and races. This resolution is forcing an opinion based on words. This resolution is forcing members to decide whether they agree with all the words on a page rather than how to actually solve the real world issue. I can tell you from my firsthand experience, I can read about the stain of slavery and racism. I can read about all the atrocities that have gone on within any culture. But until I talk directly to kids and families in the child protection system who are daily battling a world of racism, I didn't understand. There were things that I couldn't comprehend. There are things that I still can't comprehend about how some families are dealing with difficulties and the way the cards are stacked against them that I couldn't understand that other ones are dealing with. I just simply couldn't comprehend that world until I talked to colleagues across the aisle here or went directly to the families or went directly to the system that was failing so badly in some areas. That racism is a public health emergency reveals itself directly in public education as large as anywhere and reversing these negative health impacts should begin with the education of our children. Consider the unfortunate facts that we deal with. Only 35% of black children can read at grade level and only 28% are proficient in math. Only 39% of Hispanic children can read at grade level and only 32% are proficient in math. Only 37% of indigenous, indigenous children can read at grade, uh, grade level and only 28% are proficient in math. These figures are shameful and underline confidence in our, undermine, excuse me, undermine confidence in our institutions and threaten our economy. As noted within the resolution, the racial disparities in unemployment, healthcare, housing, and economic status can all be traced to the disparities in education. If the House through this resolution is to commit to dismantling racism, it must begin by dismantling the obstacles in educational equality, which we have left out in this racism. Nowhere do we mention the K-12 system. This can be best accomplished by putting the child at the center of our education system, even when, these even when those solutions cause discomfort for the very adults that serve those kids. It means empowering parents to make real choices for their children and in the best interest of their children. Members, we have in front of us a bill that has been offered by Representative Moran, has been offered by myself, that many have signed on, that came from the work of Chief Justice Alan Page and his cooperation with Neil Kashkari that allows the constitutional right of a education to become a positive right for our kids, to help our kids get an equal and an excellent education rather than allowing the system to give them an adequate one. That is a step forward. It is actions like that that can help us. In family law, the best interest of a child is the standard by which judges must weigh their decision on cases involving children. Why would we accept anything less in our system of schools? Only when the best interest of the child is the guiding principle in matters of education will education be centered on the interests of the child. We have heard the common refrain that the, the common refrain that the pandemic has exposed the significant disparities in education, but the pandemic did not cause those disparities. The pandemic also exposed that a one size fits all education system does not serve our children equitably. In fact, it holds many kids down. If our system of public schools are built to enforce systematic racism, then what remains the justification to trap children of color or children without economic means in a system designed without their best interests? Economic opportunity arises from economic opportunity. And opportunity scholarships and empowered parents are among the best tools we can employ to reform a system that clearly favors some children over others. We have been a leader in public school choice with the first in the nation charter schools and open enrollment between districts. We can now expand those choices, freeing children left behind to access educational opportunities meeting their best interests. If we want to commit this House of, Res House of Representatives to dismantle 
the current obstacles to educational opportunities that are unfortunate and shameful, shameful that ripple through our society, then we need to find a unified solution, not just words to vote on in a paper. By passing this resolution, we offer the false perception that the House took action, action on racism and achieved finality of the issue. That is the wrong message. That is the wrong message. We need to open this up. We need to tear this wound open and we need to fix it. And we need to roll up our sleeves and attack the problem with systematic solutions. So with that members, I can't vote either one way or the other. This is an incomplete process. I appreciate bringing it forward and I think we need to keep it in front, but let's work towards solutions, not just offering a resolution that has no teeth or bite to solve this issue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Stearns, Representative DeMuth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Richardson, thank you for bringing this resolution forward. Members, you've heard Representative Cresha address the achievement gap and the stats that he gave with that. Um, this is completely unacceptable, these disparities in our education system. They negatively impact our children and our families and these disparities have generational negative impact throughout our entire state. While the resolution aims to address the effects that racism has across all areas of our lives, it is a beginning and a next step. It's moving us from ignoring and then admiring the problem of racism to taking the conversation further and eventually to action. To action in education, action in housing, action in our healthcare outcomes, in our employment, and more. So with that, I will be supporting this and I'll be voting yes on the resolution. Thank you. The member from Meeker, Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, I appreciate the discussion we're having today. I think uh, Representative uh, Richardson, Cresha, Damoth have all raised some good points. I will be voting yes. The member from Dakota, Representative Halverson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Richardson, for your strong um, proposal here in front of us. What a day it is in the House of Representatives in the state of Minnesota where we have for so many years, certainly every, every year that I've been in this legislature and many years before I came here, talked about the disparities that exist in Minnesota. And I believe that there's been a lot of care, a lot of uh, concern, um, but it hasn't been followed with really effective action. And I think what we see here today is the opportunity for the House of Representatives to listen to the voices of the people who are experiencing racism as a public health crisis in their own lives and in their own communities. These are experts in our midst. And I will tell you as a state representative and somebody who loves uh, law, loves public policy, has studied um, public policy, um, professionally, personally, academically, I have a lot to learn about the way that racism has been inserted into our laws in the state of Minnesota. It's something that we need to face and something that we need to be really honest about. And let me tell you, when I started to really understand the language of our laws and where some of these laws came from, and some of these proposals came from, I knew it was time to sit back and do some listening to understand what communities of color in Minnesota are really facing. And some people would like to say that there's one, one um, magic fix. If we just fixed the education system, if we just fixed the opportunity gap in education, that somehow everything else would fall into place. And what we know is that it's not true. 
Representative Richardson is bringing forward a statement, a proposal, and a plan for the House of Representatives to look in detail in how we need to address as a body holistically the crisis of our state that is racism. A few years ago, I took a trip down to um, Selma, Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama. And it was a shock for this northern girl to spend some time walking in the footsteps of leaders like Congressman John Lewis, who was a young leader um, crossing the bridge, marching from Selma to Montgomery, asking, pleading, defending human rights, the right for people to be able to have a voice in their government by voting. Prior to 1965 in Montgomery County, Alabama, less than 250 black citizens were registered to vote. Let that sink in. That is systemic racism. And we continue to bear the burden of what that did. Think about this. This is people's parents and grandparents who didn't have a voice in their government. We spend all day every day talking to constituents who want to have a voice in their government. And in our lifetimes, many of the people in this room, in our lifetimes, this was systematically denied to people. And people shook their heads and said, boy, I just don't understand. But some people got up and fought. And Brian Stevenson, um, the great attorney, the founder of uh, the Equal Justice Initiative, um, has done a lot of work, and I, I highly recommend everybody start studying his words. Uh, he founded a legacy museum um, in Montgomery, Alabama that I went to visit. And I highly recommend everybody walk in there, because what the legacy museum is, it's a, it's, it's a, an analysis of the laws that are on our books and where they came from. Our criminal justice codes, an analysis of the laws that are on our books, on our books in the state of Minnesota, that have roots in the Jim Crow era laws. This resolution says, Minnesota House of Representatives, let's take a look at the roots of those laws and find out where that injustice lies. Voting laws that are on the books in the state of Minnesota have roots in the Jim Crow South. And that is something that I was stunned to see it with my own eyes at the Legacy Museum in Alabama. And laws that are on the books and proposals that are on the, um, being proposed to um, supposedly strengthen our education system have laws, have roots in Jim Crow. Um, particularly when we talk about vouchers. Now, does this to say that anybody who brings up such a proposal has racist intent? No. But this resolution and this conversation that is being brought forward by Representative Richardson and by members of the Posse Caucus are saying it is incumbent upon all of us as policymakers to understand the ways that racism has been internalized in all of us, including in our laws and including in proposals. And uh, we have such an opportunity to learn and understand. And uh, everybody comes here. It's one of the greatest things about being a state legislator is the opportunity to learn new things. And there's no doubt in my mind in the state of Minnesota that people are looking to learn and understand and listen. And so I ask my colleagues to learn, to understand, and to listen to Representative Richardson, to the Posse Caucus, and take this action to make a statement, to um, make a step forward that the House of Representatives is going to be a place where we are going to undo racism. And that is going to show up in our policies, but most importantly, it's gonna show up in our communities. Thank you, Representative Richardson. Thank you to the members of the Posse Caucus. I'm listening and I'm voting yes.
The member from Wright, Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So over this past weekend, we celebrated my niece's birthday. And as I have mentioned on this house floor before, I have a Hispanic background, and my sister married somebody from Africa. And I had the honor of traveling to Kenya to, and be in the wedding. So the niece, my niece, whose birthday we celebrated this past weekend, is part Hispanic, part African. And I am so excited about her opportunities and the future that she has in the state of Minnesota and this great country. And this past weekend, in anticipation of this resolution coming forward, I had some time to reflect on institutional racism. As I've heard it repeated over and over and over again by my Democrat colleagues. And so part of my reflection was to refresh myself with some of the aspects of history, not just in Minnesota, but our country. And I would start with, I am incredibly proud to be a member of the Republican Party because it was Republican Abraham Lincoln who successfully led the Civil War and ended slavery. But unfortunately, history recounts for us, Democrats refused to accept this new reality. They began to mobilize in the South, and they won state house after state house all across the South. And then with their new power, with their new authority, Democrats decided to implement, to codify institutional racism. It goes better by the name Jim Crow laws. Those are the product of the Democrat Party. Unfortunately, portions of institutional racism crept to the North. And we heard about some of it enumerated here by Representative Richardson, Representative Hassan. Unfortunately, in the state of Minnesota, we have uh, a history of racial covenants that were, and legal contracts that were embedded in private property. Very unfortunate that, that happened in Minnesota. But it is very good that those have been ended. I looked at the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the voting in Congress. The truth is, those that voted no, those the strong opposition against the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was led by the Democrat Party. By approximately two to one and three to one, depending on the House or the Senate, Democrat, those voting no were Democrats. Two or three to one. The same is true of the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Those that opposed were members of the Democrat Party. So that brings us to today. When I look around today, it is still the members of the Democrat Party who refuse to accept the reality that those that are being hurt by the legacy can be helped with choice and education. The Democrat Party continues to look the other way when members of minority classes are trapped in failing school districts. Republicans have been working for years to try to empower parents to give those children who are trapped in these failing school districts in the inner city the opportunity for a better education. Also, when you look at a history of abortion, the origin of abortion clinics here in the state of Minnesota, not, I'm sorry, not Minnesota, the country. Madam Speaker, Margaret Sanger, ardent racist, 
And I don't think it's an accident that abortion clinics are predominantly found in the inner city. It's a good thing presently in the state of Minnesota, our institutions do, pardon me, do not have racism. Institutional racism that was codified by the Democrats has been ripped out and doesn't exist. Now there are individual racists that continue to persist in their mindset of bigotry. And that needs to come to an end. But unfortunately, the resolution before us falls far short of achieving that. As has been mentioned, education is absent from this resolution. So this is the truth, members, about the history of institutional racism. And again, I am very proud to be a member of the party that has been working for decades to end racist thinking, to end bigotry, to empower people, to live up to the founding of this country that our individual liberty, our unalienable rights have been endowed by our creator to all people. And that is what I continue to fight for, and that is what the party that I am in, the Republican Party, continues to fight for. Again, Madam Speaker, this resolution falls short of those ideals. Thank you. The member from Hennepin, the Majority Leader, Representative Winkler. Thank you, Madam Speaker, uh, and thank you, Representative Richardson, for bringing this resolution forward uh, and for uh, bringing us to a point of calling our attention and our focus on an issue that is uh, too easily dismissed, uh, too easily swept aside in arguments about unrelated things like partisanship uh, or how a resolution doesn't quite fit and is not quite fitting right. It's too easy to ignore and have excuses, and this resolution uh, prevents us from doing that. I would like to call the House's attention particularly to the fact that of the uh, clauses, um, uh, in which we set forth how the House will take action on this resolution, uh, lines 2.18 through 2.34. Of those uh, five, I'm sorry, of those six provisions, four of them relate to the House of Representatives as an institution. Two of them relate to public policy. Uh, lines 2.19 and 2.20 talk about the need to work to ensure public confidence that public safety is administered equitably and I'm pleased to say that through a tremendous amount of hard work, we are very close to an agreement to carrying out the very first of those provisions uh, by passing a significant police reform and accountability bill. Uh, we are very close, and we have hopes that we can actually accomplish that today. So that's the very first. The second relate to the pra practices, policies, hiring, vendor selection, uh, and other actions taken by the House of Representatives as an institution. Uh, this resolution calls on us to look at ourselves closely, to listen more and understand ourselves and our actions better. And I think that each of us as an individual member, but certainly as a, the House as an institution, can do so much more to understand the ways that this institution continues to perpetuate inequality uh, and to make sure that as we move forward uh, through the next election cycle and creating the next House of Representatives, which we remake in certain ways every two years, that these questions of equity and racism are at the heart of our policy making as an institution. Uh, we do in fact have considerable mention of education in the resolution. Uh, the resolution uh, whereas clauses specifically talk about education and in lines 2.26 through 2.28 a range of issues that affect education and specifically calling out early childhood are at the heart of our policy and I don't think anybody could possibly believe in good faith that the author of this resolution does not include all of education and education disparities in the concerns raised in this resolution. That's a frankly ridiculous notion. Education is at the heart of this resolution. And finally, we talk about in the end uh, 2.29 through 2.31 and 2.32 to 2.34 about the ways in which the House can conduct a thorough examination of itself through a uh, select committee 
and understanding, uh, better understanding of how we as an institution make this work. Because dismantling systemic racism, dismantling systems of oppression are not an issue just for people of color. They are an a issue for all of us, and especially for those of us who have power and privilege to exercise authority and to move in this world in a way in which we know that nobody will ever question our ability or our right to be in certain spaces or to take certain actions or to say certain things. My leadership is never questioned. My legitimacy is never questioned uh, because of my race or my gender. Maybe my acts, possibly my opinions, but not because of who I am. And at its heart, racism is a belief that who you are makes you unfit to be a full citizen, a full member of our community, or a full leader in this institution. And it's time we make that change. Finally, members, I would just like to point out that we have uh, people of color serving in both political parties, and the House of Representatives is a more diverse institution than it ever has been before. And the fact that we may agree or disagree on certain uh, ways of addressing public policy concerns or different ways of addressing these inequities doesn't change the fact that we are talking about an issue that is vitally important, primarily because the members of this House are different than they have been in the past. And who shows up here matters. So, Representative uh, Richardson, I want to say thank you for bringing this forward. Members of the Posse Caucus, I want to say thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, members of color who are not part of the Posse Caucus, thank you for participating in the debate. We can do much better than we have done, and this resolution is the first step in that process. Please vote yes. The member from Hennepin, Representative Noor. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Thank you, Representative Ruth Richardson, for this important resolution. This is not about Democrat versus Republicans. This is not about liberal versus conservatism. This is about right and wrong. The murder of George Floyd sparked outrage and tossed Minnesota on the global spotlight. A state that is known to be one of the base one of the best states in the quality of life is also known for its significant disparities. From education, housing, employment, social mobility, criminal justice, and more. We can't hide, we can't look away from the issues that we see every single day. We do not get here in one day. We have significant income and wealth inequality in our state. Members, we have to start acknowledging the problems that we see in our society. It's the sum of many policy choices woven in our systems over many generations. These disparities today are rooted in the systems of racism and legacy of slavery. The deepest foundation of US economy were built on forced labor of African Americans and exploration taking away land from the indigenous people. We've heard about home ownership and how it builds wealth, how it gives people the opportunity to send their kids to school when many young people are told that education is the great equalizer, that they need to go to college, guess what? We've got a system that extracts wealth from the same people that we're trying to tell them the only way to do is to go through education system. They have got overwhelming high student debts. Is that the best way that we can deal with? The same system that we're saying it's gonna build a society that is inclusive. Members, that's not the right way of doing things. It's looking towards our own history of what has happened. You see, when I see the place that I live, that a three bedroom is 3,000, that the same system that we're providing those who are wealthy and well connected, the resources for the state that we're spending to create the inequities that we see in our society. Gentrification, homelessness, 
We've got people right now living in tents in Minnesota, predominantly people of color indigenous. We should be outraged by that. You know, when we try to help and see the red lights in so many places that we're not doing well, then when one person is left out, we should all be able to say, this is not who we are. When you, we talked about the redlining and discrimination in housing, the racial covenants, whereby places where people of color, indigenous and black people live are considered to be bad places, the racial segregation that we create through our systems, when we fight for those equalities, we're told, no, you have to wait, the pie is small. Let the pie get bigger. Members, the pie isn't getting bigger. We need that share of that pie to go to the members of society who've been left out. When we said, let's help, what happened in, on leg streets, Broadway, Midway, where people of color indigenous own businesses, the answer is no. A young man by the name of Musa told me, I'm not expecting anything. We have seen this before. We say Minneapolis and St. Paul should pay for, for the problem that they created. No, it's not that. It's because of racism that we cannot allow to support those businesses. We have to admit the facts. Today, the median income for people of color indigenous is twice below the people of white in the state of Minnesota. More than 40% of people of color indigenous live below the federal poverty guidelines. Home ownership for black in the state of Minnesota is 20% compared to 80% for white. Where's the equality? Where's the system that was built for all the people? You know, when people of color indigenous often see their unemployment rates go up sooner when the economy goes down and they find hard to find jobs. And also in a system whereby it favors people within the same network and also creates a system, a phenomena, where we say you are hired last but fired first. Those are the institutions that we've created. That at one point in my life, I was told you're lucky enough to work in our system here. That you don't belong here. The institutional racism that I've experienced and I've lived through, those are things that people need to hear from us. If we were to right the systemic wrongs and racial injustice and economic injustice, we must begin acknowledging that these systems have always had beneficiaries. The communities who face hostility and injustice will continue to face harsh realities in social and political and economic landscape for too long. We see how people of color indigenous are systematically drawn into jobs that offer low wages, few benefits, lack of scheduled hours, and incomes below their peers. The pandemic system has shown us that they are the frontline workers, they're the essential workers, they're the ones who are going to be impacted by COVID-19. And yet, we don't acknowledge that. We have to look through the lens of equity, the bills that we bring here. We have to ask ourselves, what have we done wrong? Where can we do right? We can be talking about change. For real change, all community members need to acknowledge and knock down the systemic barriers that we see along racial lines. The fact that people cannot truly be free if they're systematically excluded. They're subjected to economic indignity, injustice. Racial justice cannot be won without economic justice. Many people live in fear, in fear of bringing people 
to receive that piece of the pie because they'll be excluded. Racism, my members, was embedded in our systems from the start. And systemic racism requires systemic solutions. It requires fairness. It requires justice. It requires equity. It requires inclusion. Members, I end by saying, please take, take your knee off our necks and let us thrive. Please see us. Please hear us. So I urge you to support the resolution today. And thank you so much for hearing my pleas. Thank you so much. The member from Anoka, Representative Scott. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. And um, I want to take a little bit of a different approach here um, with this resolution. And one thing to me that's glaringly absent is addressing um, the issue. And I think it's related to poverty. It's related to a lot of the problems that have been discussed here this morning. And that issue is the fact of the number in the, uh, particularly the African American community and in the American Indian community of single parent households. And I have data right in front of me that says um, in the uh, American Indian uh, single parent households, 53%. Black or African American, 65%. Um, and folks, as you all know, I have been a big advocate of children having the active involvement of both parents in their homes or in their lives. And I have, I have worked on this since um, I have been in the legislature. And we had the opportunity uh, last year to pass some laws that would make this a more equitable system, a more equitable um, opportunity for kids to have access to both parents in their household, and you played games on the House floor and voted it down. This is one of the biggest problems that keeps people in poverty, keeps people from being able to purchase a home, is because they have single-parent households. And folks, I don't think we can solve this issue without address, solve the issue of racism and the, the issue of these inequities that you're speaking of without first addressing the fact that in many cases, the dads have been marginalized. They've been written out of their children's lives. And I think it's linked without question to the issues that you've been speaking about here. Many of you met with constituents before you were elected and, you, get, and you, you met with constituents that were where this issue was important to them. You signed on to the bill originally. Then somebody went around and talked a bunch of you out of it. And I think that's really a sad scenario. These kids need their dads. And if there's no good reason for them not to have contact with their dads, if there's no abuse, if there's if there are issues, of course, we don't want any child to be in danger. And we do look at the best interest of the child, as was mentioned earlier. But when, when are we going to wake up and see the systemic problem here of the single parent household and the effect that it has on the children, their education, their ability to come out of poverty? When are we going to make that connection? I hope it's very soon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Ramsey, Representative Moran. Speaker. Hello. Hello. Madam Speaker right and members. I'm sorry. I stand in support of HR1. Thank you, Representative Richardson. Today, I proudly stand to declare racism a public health crisis and do so in the, in the memory of Congressman John Lewis, born 1940, deceased July 17, 2020. Representative John Lewis was a civil rights icon, a freedom fighter, 
a courageous black man and the conscience of Congress who once said, we are Americans. We can make this work. We can create a better world. It has been said that being black is bad for your health and pervasive racism is the cause. That's the conclusion of multiple public health studies over more than three decades. And according to Dr. George Benjamin, executive director of the American Public Health Association, we do not know, we do know, we do know that health inequities at their very core are due to racism. There's no doubt about that. More recently, research has shown that racial health disparities don't just affect poor African Americans. They also cross class lines. Dr. Benjamin said, as a black man, my status, my suit and tie don't protect me. The data is stark. Black women are up to four times more likely to die of pregnancy-related complications than white women. Black men are more than twice as likely to be killed by police as a white man. And the average life expectancy of an African-American is four years lower than the rest of the U.S. population. I can say routinely that poverty is a public health issue. And most people can understand that. If I talk about violence as a public health issue, about half of those same people would agree. But when I talk about racism as a public health issue, almost no one agrees or gets it. Maybe that's because some don't see color, which is impossible. The bleak statistic have helped convince more than 20 cities and counties of at least three states right now, Michigan, Ohio, and Wisconsin, to declare racism as a public health crisis, and there's more to come. To help you better understand health disparities, Dr. Faith E. Flesher, Assistant Professor of Health Behavior at the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Public Health, says the stress of dealing with racism in itself is a major public health problem. Anti-Black racism is ingrained in the fabric of American society. Black people experience systemic racism, a chronic stressor throughout their lifetime, which negatively impacts their physical, emotional, and our mental health. The COVID-19 pandemic, according to studies, is killing African Americans at a far greater rate than white Americans. Underlying conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, and asthma make people more vulnerable to the virus. And black Americans are more likely to have these diseases than white Americans because black people experience systemic racism, a chronic stressor throughout our lifetime, which negatively impacts our physical, emotional, and our mental health. When it comes to discussing racism and public health, words matter. The expert says that it's important to reference, to refer to racism as a public health crisis instead of an issue. Not only is it more accurate but it's also necessary to know that racism also meets the four criteria of the, CC, of the CDC required in order for something to be considered a public health problem. That means that, number one, it places a huge burden on society that continues to increase. Two, it impacts certain parts of the population more than others. Three, there's evidence that preventative strategies could help and for that hasn't happened yet. And while we're on the subject of words, I want to remind you that when we talk about race, we're really talking about skin color. 
there's only one race on this planet, homo sapiens. And to use the word race and talking about skin color is our first mistake. Dr. Faith E. Fletcher, assistant professor of health behavior at the University of Minnesota at Birmingham School of Public Health, says the stress of dealing with racism in itself is a public health problem. Anti-Black racism is ingrained in the fabric of American society. Black people experience systemic racism, a chronic stressor throughout their life, which negatively impacts our physical, emotional, and mental health. Now, I know there are people who dismiss laws positioning racism as a public health emergency as being only symbolic and not capable of facilitating real change. And there are many who point to other pieces of legislation that the state has passed, like reducing criminal penalties as being a sufficient way of addressing racism. But that is not enough because those laws never get to the root causes of the problem, meaning that they are destined to happen again. One of the aims is to break that cycle. If you are telling me, a black person, a black legislator, a black woman, and a black leader, this is what we've done to help your people. Take it and don't ask questions. That is the problem that we're dealing with. The fact that people believe that they know better about what I need and my community need I'm sorry, folks, but that's why supremacy at its finest makes you uncomfortable, right? And you are exhibiting it every time you fight us on something like this resolution by saying it's not significant. You can't tell me it's insignificant for a governmental body to essentially say that Black lives matter because for 400 years we've been told that we don't matter in words and in action. And while legislature may be willing to pass laws on what I refer to as low-hanging fruit issues, like education reform, criminal justice reform, healthcare, housing policy, many aren't willing to take the next step and address racism directly. For example, the infant mortality rates with black babies dying at disproportionately higher rates than white babies. There has been work on legislation designed to decrease these statistics through actions like making Medicaid covers more accessible and giving out creels for babies. But what has been missing for a large portion of this conversation is the impact that racism has on women, on black women who carry these babies which create a physiological change in the chronic inflammation, which makes it a hostile environment for an infant to live in. What do you think about that? And I get it. Everybody has the same goal. We want these babies to live, but not so much that we're willing to tackle racism. Another example, according to the American Psychological Association, The stress associated with racism increases the risk for several chronic conditions like heart disease, chronic diseases that we know about, right? Diabetes and most inflammatory and autoimmune disorder. As a legislature, we must begin to address the fundamental causes of much of the experience intergenerational trauma for blacks in America, systemic racism rather than merely focus on the symptoms like the chronic stressors and the trauma. Higher rates of poverty, unemployment, poor housing, poor educational outcomes, and toxic environmental exposure, as well as less access to quality medical care, also contribute to poor overall health in Black communities. But after class and poverty are accounted for, African Americans still have worse health outcomes than white Americans who do not have to deal with or worry about racism. Public health studies have shown that racism, African Americans, indigenous 
and people of color experience in their daily lives create the stress that affects their internal organs and their overall physical health. This results in a higher prevalence of chronic disease such as high blood pressure, asthma, diabetes, in a shorter lifespan. Still, still, some elected officials have questions. Not so long ago, maybe only a couple of weeks ago, an Ohio lawmaker discussed whether to declare the public health crisis. Republican State Senator Steve Hoffman wonder allows if more residents were getting COVID-19 because they had poor hygiene. <laughs> Could it just be that African-Americans or the color population do not wash their hands as well as other groups or wear a mask or do not socially distance themselves, said Hoffman, Hoffman, who is an emergency room doctor. Could that be the explanation for why the higher incidence? This is from a health professional. The health equity gap between wealthy African-Americans and well-to-do whites, whites is even wider. A 2018 study by researchers at Ohio State University found that racial disparities in health tend to be more pronounced at the upper end of the socioeconomic spectrum. The cause, acute and chronic discrimination, the researchers said. People tend to think of racism as an individual thing. And that's regrettable because they don't connect the 400 plus years of systemic legal racism that led to the death of many Black and Indigenous Americans. America's number one sin is called slavery whether it's in police-involved killing or desperate health outcomes where Black patients can't get treatment because they're not seen as being sick or financially redlining in certain zip codes, food desert is ultimately due to racism. You, we can, you, we can solve a problem. We can't solve a problem until we define it. So the first step, the first thing that you and we must do is name racism. Name it when you see it. You got to call it for what it is. If it hurts people, if it kills people, it's a public health crisis. Although the idea of recognizing racism as a, deter as a detriment to public health, this isn't new. It has gained traction since the police killing of George Floyd and the subsequent protests around the country. On top of that, people of color, African Americans in particular, has been disproportionately affected by COVID-19 pandemic. And thanks to the coronavirus outbreak, <laughs> I'm thinking of coronavirus outbreak, right? But this is what happened, has happened. We have had a crash court in public health over the past few months. For the first time in my lifetime, maybe our lifetime, we've had to grapple with the idea of relinquishing some of our own autonomy and freedom in order to help the greater good. In this case, the, public, the, the health of the public. And though we still have a long way to go, we're finally getting used to thinking of health in terms of our interconnectedness, rather than solely on an individual basis. With public health being top of the mind of many people right now, it's the ideal time to use that language and framing it to take on systemic racism. Health disparities are the inequalities that occur in the provision of health care and access to health care across different racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. If we are going to if we are going to prevent these racism from living in this state, from living within this state, we must first acknowledge that racism is real. 
it is the root of all the great disparities we see in our state, within our systems, and we must, and you must, be better listeners of those impacted by racism to legislate and create better opportunities that lift up all of us. Let me say this again. If we're going to prevent these racism from living in this state, from living within this state, we must, you must first acknowledge racism is real. It is the root of all the great disparities we see in our state, within every system, and we must and you must be better listeners of those impacted by racism to legislate and create better opportunities that look up all of us. Congressman John Lewis, known as the conscience of Congress, who said, we are American. We can make this work. We can create a better world. And I stand with Congressman John Lewis to say that we can create a better world for our grandbabies, for our great grandbabies. Today, we start to be the conscious of Minnesotans. I ask you to support HR1. Thank you. The author of the resolution, the member from Dakota, Representative Richardson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. When we talk about racism being a public health crisis, and we talk about the impact of systemic racism, it's not about personal opinion. We are relying on data and peer-reviewed studies. We can point to the large number of national and Minnesota-based medical associations that have all acknowledged the harm of systemic racism. Where is the data and peer-reviewed research studies from medical associations saying systemic racism doesn't exist? At what point exactly did centuries of anti-Black racism from slavery level off? What was the exact day? What was the time? What was happening in the world the day that systemic racism ended in Minnesota and in the United States? Because there are many Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and Asian Minnesotans that are asking that question because they are calling out the harm that they're experiencing right now, today, and they are calling on leaders to dismantle systemic racism within our state. We all can acknowledge that education is a key element of addressing inequities. And one important way that we can start ensuring that kids are getting an access to an equitable education is to ensure that our Black and Indigenous students are in school and that they're not being expelled disproportionately or suspended at disproportionate rates. Because it's really to reach developmental milestones when you're being excluded from classrooms. And even if we can begin to move the needle on the education system, there is still so much to be done to address the preventable deaths in Black and Indigenous communities and other communities of color as well. Systemic racism has deadly consequences. Our systems are working just the way that they were designed to work and they're having harmful impacts. This revolution is about advancing and promoting equitable opportunity across all of our systems in the areas of health, education, housing, public safety, economic development, and workforce development as well. The COVID-19 pandemic and the senseless murder of George Floyd have shined a light on the historical and contemporary injustices that are still embedded deeply within our societies. In this critical moment, we as a body must decide where we stand on dismantling racism in our communities and in our systems. The words of Representative John Lewis seem a fitting close for today. When you see something that is not right, not just, not fair, you have a moral obligation to say something, to do something. Our children and their children will ask you, 
What did you do? What did you say? We have a mission and a mandate to be on the right side of history. Members, I ask you to vote yes in favor of House Resolution uh, House Resolution 1. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, I request a roll call. Um, members, uh, the procedure for requesting a roll, hall, roll call is the showing of hands. And if people would like to raise their hands for a roll call, uh, they can send an email to hands at house.mn. And we will only, again, count the ones that come from members of the Minnesota House of Representatives. But we will wait uh, 60 seconds to determine if there are 15 hands. All right, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. The clerk will take the roll on the resolution. <clears throat> Acom. Acom, aye. Acom, aye. Albright. Albright, no. Anderson. Anderson, no. Anderson, no. Backer. Backer, no. Backer, no. Bonner. Bonner, yes. Bonner, aye. Barr. Barr, no. Barr, no. Baker. Uh, Baker, no. Baker, no. Becker Finn. Becker Finn, aye. Bennett. Bennett, no. Bennett, no. Bernardi. Bernardi, aye. Bernardi, aye. Bierman. Beerman, aye. Beerman, aye. Bo. Bo, oh, no. Bo, aye. Bo, aye. Brand. Brand, yes. Brand, aye. Cantrell. Cantrell, aye. Cantrell, aye. Carlson, A. Carlson, A, aye. Carlson, A, aye. Carlson, L. <laughs> Carlson, L, aye. Carlson L. I. Christensen. Christensen I. Christensen I. Claflin. Claflin I. Claflin I. Considine. Considine I. Considine I. Daniels. Daniels no. Daniels no. Doubt. Doubt no. Davids. Davids no. Daphne. Daphne I. Davney, I. Dean. Dean, I. Dean, I. Damoth. Damoth, I. Detmer. Detmer, no. Detmer, no. Draskowski. Draskowski, no. Draskowski, no. Eklund. Eklund, I. Eklund, I. Edelson. Edelson, I. Edelson, I. Elkins. Elkins, I. Elkins, I. Erickson. Erickson, no. Erickson, no. Fabian. Fabian, no. Fabian, no. Fisher. Fisher, I. Fisher, I. Franzen. Excused. Freiburg. Freiburg votes yes. Freiburg, I. Garofalo. Garofalo. Gomez. Gomez, I. Gomez, I. Green. Green, no. Green, no. Grossel. Grossel, no. Grossel, no. Grunhagen. Pass. Grunhagen, pass. Grunhagen, pass. Gunther. Gunther, no. Gunther, no. Haley. Haley, I. Haley, I. Halverson. Halverson, I. Hamilton. Hamilton, I. Hamilton, I. Hanson. 
Hanson I. Hanson I. Hassan. Hassan, yes. Hassan I. Hausman. Hausman I. Hausman I. Heinrich. Heinrich, no. Heinrich, no. Heinzman. Heinzman, no. Heinzman, no. Her. Her, I. Her, I. Hertas. Hertas. Hornstein. Hornstein, I. Hornstein, I. Howard. Howard, I. Howard, I. Hewitt. Hewitt, I. Hewitt, I. Johnson. Johnson, no. Jordan. Jordan, I. Jordan, I. Jurgens. Jurgens, I. Jurgens, I. Keel. Keel, no. Keel, no. Cleavorn. Cleavorn, I. Cleavorn, I. Kegel. Kegel, I. Kegel, I. Katiza Watoon. Katiza Watoon, I. Katiza Watoon, I. Kosnick. Kosnick. Kreshaw. Kreshaw. Kunish Podin. Kunish Podin, I. Kunish Podin, I. Layman. Layman, I. Layman, I. Lee. Lee, I. Lesh. Lesh, I. Lesh, I. Liebling. Liebling, I. Liebling, I. Lean. Lean, I. Lean, I. Lily. Lily, I. Lily, I. Lippert. Lippert, I. Lippert, I. Lisligard. Lisligard, I. Lisligard, I. Long. Long, I. Lucero. Lucero, no. Lewick. Lewick, no. Lewick, no. Mahoney. Mahoney. Man. Man, I. Man, I. Mariani. Mariani, I. Mariani, I. Marquardt. Marquardt, I. Marquardt, I. Mason. Mason, I. Mason, I. McDonald. McDonald, no. McDonald, no. Mecklen. Mecklen, no. Mecklen, no. Miller. Miller, no. Miller, no. Moeller. Moeller, I. Moeller, I. Moran. Moran, I. Moran, I. Morrison. Morrison, I. Morrison, I. Munson. Munson, no. Murphy. Murphy, I. Murphy, I. Nash. Nash, no. Nash, no. Nelson M. Nelson M. I. Nelson M. I. Nelson N. Nelson N. No. Nelson N. No. New. New. No. Nor. Nor. I. Nornis. Nornis. No. Nornis. No. Novotny. Novotny. No. Novotny. No. O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll, Olson, Olson I, O'Neill, O'Neill Pass, O'Neill Pass, Palowski, Palowski I, Palowski I, Purcell, Purcell I, Purcell I, Petersburg, Petersburg no. Petersburg, no. Pearson. Pearson. Pinto. Pinto, I. Pinto, I. Poppy. Poppy, I. Poppy, I. Poston. Poston, no. Poston, no. Prior. 
Prior, aye. Prior, aye. Quam. Quam. Richardson. Richardson, aye. Richardson, aye. Robbins. Robbins, no. Runbeck. Runbeck, no. Runbeck, no. Sandell. Sandell, aye. Sandell, aye. Sandstead. Sandstead, aye. Sandstead, aye. Sauk. Sauk, aye. Sauk, aye. Schumacher. Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. Schultz. Aye. Schultz, aye. Scott. Scott, no. Scott, no. Stevenson. Stevenson, aye. Stevenson, aye. Sundin. Sundin, aye. Sundin, aye. Swazinski. Swazinski, no. Swazinski, no. Tabke. Tabke, aye. Tabke, aye. Tice. Tice. Torkelson. Torkelson, no. Erdahl. Yes. Erdahl, aye. Vang. Vang, yes. Vang, aye. Vogel. Vogel, no. Vogel, no. Wagenius. Wagenius, aye. Wagenius, aye. Waslowick. Waslowick, aye. Waslowick, aye. West. West, Winkler, Winkler, I, Wolgamot, Wolgamot, I, Wolgamot, I, Zhang J, Zhang J, I, Zhang J, I, Zhang T, Zhang T, I, Zhang T, I, Yuakim, Yuakim, I, Yuakim, I, Speaker Hartman, Speaker Hartman. I. Garofalo. Garofalo. Grunhagen. Grunhagen. Hertos. Hertos. Kosnick. Kosnick. Creshaw. Creshaw. Mahoney. Mahoney, aye. Mahoney, aye. O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll, pass. O'Driscoll, pass. O'Neill. O'Neill. Pearson. Pearson. Quam. Pass. Quam, pass. Quam, pass. Tice. Tice. West. West.
There being 82 ayes and 40 nays, the resolution is adopted. Representative Winkler. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm about to move a recess to the call of the chair. Uh, DFL members, we will be caucusing at approximately 1.30, and I think members can expect probably a, uh, okay, a 2 o'clock. Uh, the speaker always likes longer breaks than the majority leader does. Uh, members, uh, we will, uh, DFL members, we will caucus at approximately 2 o'clock, and we are likely to return to the chamber at approximately 3 o'clock, but it will be to the call of the chair. Uh, so, Madam Speaker, I move a recess to the call of the chair. And I just want to briefly indicate what it is we're waiting for, for, for members. Madam Speaker, uh, I don't think I yielded to your question. But uh, I did mention during my comments on the resolution that we are working on final language for a police accountability and reform bill, and we hope to have that language available to caucus by 2 o'clock and to return to the floor at 3 approximately to pass it. Madam Speaker, I move a recess to the call of the chair. Any uh, announcements before the recess? Representative Winkler moves a recess to the call of the chair. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The House stands in recess.